My name is Louisa Griva. I'm here at the National Endowment for Democracy with the Programs Department. And I want to say the National Endowment for Democracy is very grateful to our co-sponsors for today's event, the Uyghur American Association and the Laogai Museum. It's a, been a real pleasure to work with both of them um, to bring together our speakers and you as our guests uh, for our dialogue on really very difficult and important questions uh, on ethnic relations in China today. Uh, the president of the Uyghur American Association, Rabia Kadir, and the director of the UAA's Uyghur Human Rights Project would both much, uh, would have liked to be here today, but they're um, traveling in Europe uh, speaking about Uyghur human rights issues, and so they couldn't be with us today. I want to uh, mention that NED has been supporting programs related to ethnic issues in China since the er early 1990s. This is not something new for us. In fact, the, the principles guiding our work in this area uh, can be found in NED's founding document, our, our statement of principles and objectives, which was written and approved by our board of directors in 1984. And in fact, the words that you see illuminated on the panel when you walk into the NED, through the NED front door, are a quotation from that document defining democracy. And this document, which has served as the foundation of NED's support for 25 years now, ha did carefully emphasize the importance of ethnic issues, the guarantee of minority rights as an important pillar of dem functioning democratic systems, uh, the importance of inter-ethnic dialogue in creating a consensus for democratic processes for political representation uh, and voice in the political system, and also political accommodation between and among ethnic groups in creating a functioning democratic political system. And for NED, our first grants along these lines for China were for Tibetan groups in the early 1990s. Uh, these groups were working on a variety of projects, democratic education for Tibetans, uh, mostly in exile. Those who had left China had never had a chance to observe uh, democracy although they were now newly living in a democratic system in India. Uh, these projects also worked hard to advocate for and propose democratic solutions to the problems faced by Tibetans in China. The NED's first grant for projects addressing, a project addressing the same concern for the Uyghurs uh, was given in 2004. It was to the Uyghur American Association to launch the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Uh, the director of the project at the time was Nuri Turkel, one of our speakers today. And as I said, the current director is Alam Setov, who is sorry that he can't be here today. Uh, since that first grant, now only five years ago, uh, three more Uyghur projects, three, three more Uyghur organizations organized by Uyghur Democrats, unfortunately in exile, uh, three more of such organizations have received NED grant support uh, since then. And these projects are all designed to enable Uyghurs who are living in free societies to serve as uh, what you might call a, a voice for the voiceless, um, to raise awareness about the human rights situation faced by Uyghurs living in, in Xinjiang and, and elsewhere in China, and again, to promote democratic solutions to the concerns of the Uyghurs um, as a distinct ethnic group in China. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if you look at the media this week, just this week, the U.S. Uh, the, uh, during our own American president's visit to Beijing, uh, according to Xinhua, the government news agency, Hu Jintao told President Obama on Tuesday that, quote, China hoped, or this is again what the media report says, China hoped the U.S. will not allow separatists, quote unquote, to use U.S. soil to stage anti-China activities aim to split the country. Familiar uh, rhetoric for those who uh, know how the Chinese official media and government treat uh, ethnic concerns, particularly those um, raised by Tibetans and Uyghurs. A couple of points about this statement. Obviously, it reflects a severe misunderstanding of the nature of freedom of speech in, a, in an open society like uh, the US and uh, all democracies. 
I also wanted to say for the record, neither NED nor any of the Uyghur organizations that NED supports, and I think in your packet you'll have a complete listing of all of NED's programs that support Uyghur democratic groups. This is a very, this is a transparent organization and we make our grant uh, information available to the public. Um, none of these groups are advocating uh, to split the country. Uh, they are not raising the flag of independence. They want to leave open the question of a democratic voice to d democratic decision-making processes to determine the future of uh, China and for the, for the people living in Xinjiang uh, or East Turkestan, another term for the same uh, land. So any of these grantees, I want to put very much on the record for our media and other participants, um, these grantees are advocating peacefully for the realization of Uyghurs' democratic rights and freedoms. They frequently condemned violence, both violence used for political aims and also the communal violence that has not been terribly frequent uh, in the history of the PRC, but which we saw terribly um, brought home uh, on, in July in Urumqi, this communal violence of ethnic hatred, uh, but all these organizations are on the record condemning this. And finally, they're on the record as strongly supporting the human rights of all citizens of the People's Republic of China. Our purpose uh, today is not to raise awareness, to further enumerate the grievances, uh, the rights violations experienced by the Uyghurs or Hans or Chinese citizens in general. Our purpose is to provide a civil and dispassionate forum to discuss a passionate issue, an extremely difficult, uh, even viscerally emotional topic. Um, we hope that our speakers and also participants in the audience during the question and answer period uh, will speak honestly. No need for self-censorship. Uh, on the other hand, we hope that all participants will aim for a very sympathetic, uh, open attitude to hearing other viewpoints about uh, the complexity of the issues, what happened on July 5th, and its aftermath. And finally, we have asked uh, all of our speakers and hope that all of our participants will focus on um, exploring constructive pathways out of what is uh, a very, very dark and um, dark maze of negative trends that we're seeing happening now. Uh, we don't expect miracles out of our one forum, but we do hope that this forum today um, will provide us with uh, some start on that path, even if they're very, very small steps on a long journey. So now it's my pleasure and, my, uh, and an honor to introduce Harry Wu, um, who will uh, also give welcoming remarks. Uh, as the founder and executive director of the Lagai Research Foundation, he's done heroic work over the last 17 years, uh, exposing the horrors of China's Laogai prison camp system. Um, as the founder of the Laogai Museum, he's uh, responsible for, uh, along with the museum director, Nicole Kempton, bringing now a special exhibition that is uh, there, uh, had opened last week and is now uh, on display through March uh, on the Laogai in Xinjiang. Uh, and of course, we invite you to visit that exhibit very close by here on 11th Street. So Harry will now say uh, a few words of welcome. Please welcome him. Thank you, Louisa. I am <clears throat> very happy, ha happy to be here. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking our partner organization of this event National Endowment for Democracy and the Uyghur American Association. It has a, a privilege working with you both on this grand opening, grand breaking, breaking conference. And we are at the Laogai Research Foundation hope that to be, to build our successful partnership in the future. And I very welcome all of the people here today to join this meeting. I was uh, traveled to Xinjiang twice, 1991, 1994. I can tell you one very small story. I was in the Jeep and the driver is a Wilgo and my guardian is a Wilgo 
both of them, but they can speak Chinese. Once we was on Aksu, I found there's some people quarrel. It's a Chinese, a Han Chinese, and quarrel with a Uyghur. Few minutes later, all the people on the, on the street and all of them were Uyghur, gathering, surrounding the Chinese, and the Chinese were beat by the Uyghur. I was very shocked. I asked the people, say, what's going on? Why the Chinese never joined together, fight against with the Uyghur? He said, well, you are the first time in Xinjiang. And all the time, the Uyghur stand together, fight against the Han. You know, I was in China many years, but I didn't realize this is a serious conflict. And I learned this nationalism between the two different people so seriously. And then I went back to China and learned about, uh, back to America and learned about the history that I find now Xinjiang is a big problem. Unfortunately, my brother was in Xinjiang around 35 years. He was the member of the Bing Tuan and now he retired back to Shanghai. Bing Tuan is a very serious problem in Xinjiang. It's more than two million people control the economic and political and military forces. And you heard 1990, the Baron Shang uprising, it was surrounded by Bing Tuan. And all the people was arrested. Many of them was killed by the Bing Tuan people. And the other issue is Xinjiang is the area for the Chinese to practice their nuclear weapon. How many times? We don't know. Maybe 40, maybe 50 times. And a lot of we going to today is to have the disease about the nuclear testing. So I just like, we Chinese say, jing di zi wa, like a frog in the well. I did not know the outside world. So 1994, two trips, just I, just like the frog, met the fish who was come from the sea. And she tell me that what is the truth. So I want to remind you, today we're holding a conference, a, a museum in our Laogai Museum, so-called Laogai Museum in Weigo, Xinjiang area. We, until today, we do not know how many camps was in, located in Xinjiang Weibo area. Just like we have some information, the Laogai in Tibet, we, not, we are not really sure how many camps located in Tibet, okay? And the Han Chinese treating the Xinjiang and and do the I mean, Qinghai area, just like a Siberia of the Soviet Union, okay? Every year from the East Coast, from Beijing, from Shanghai, from Guangzhou, they arrange number, maybe a couple of thousand prisoners removed from their hometown to Xinjiang or to Andu area. And there was reform, so-called reform, and uh, forced labor in Qinghai and Xinjiang all the time. And in these camps, there's no any Uyghur or Tibetan, only Han Chinese, and they never come back. Because the Han Chinese, they knew the Uyghur or the Tibetan never can unite it or stand together or fight against the Han authority with the Han immigrants over there. Han Chinese, even they are the target, even they are suppressed by the government, they still fight against the Uyghur and Tibet. So many people actually in Xinjiang, maybe two, half of two million people, or they are directly sometimes was uh, prisoners or become a former prisoners or the prisoner family. 
this is a very sad story that we have to know about. Okay. So today we have many Xinjiang prisoners, include Rivia Cadell, include her husband, include two sons, and many other people that is a Laogai survival or Laogai prisoner today inside China. This is a suppression machine for the Han authority located in Xinjiang. So we really have to think about what is the could happen in the near future of the Tibet, of the Uyghur. Today, Uyghur Association in United States seriously fighting against the communist regime. I hope uh, Uyghur, and same as the Tibetan, fight against the communism inside China. Maybe one day they will become freedom or maybe become a new, new independent country. But you have to know, Xinjiang actually is not a part of China. It's occupation for the Chinese. But it's a long way to fight for it. I hope one day we can see the way we'll become an independent country. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for your remarks. <clears throat> um, I'd like to thank NED for hosting this event today, and um, I'd particularly like to thank Louisa and Amanda Wood um, for their efforts. Um, and I, I really want to express uh, my personal thanks and, um, and my gratitude on behalf of the Uyghur American Association and the Uyghur Human Rights Project um, to Harry and everyone at the um, Laogai Research Foundation and the Laogai Museum, including um, Nicole and Megan and Lindsay and, uh, and, and Michael and, and everyone there, um, not only for um, co-sponsoring this event, but for putting, putting so much work into the Uyghur Human Rights exhibit that's um, going on now at the Laogai Museum, and for, for your continuing um, work to, to raise awareness about um, uh, Uyghur and Tibetan rights issues and to pr promote dialogue between um, Han Chinese and, and Uyghurs and Tibetans. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sean Roberts. Um, he is currently the uh, director of the International Development Studies <coughs> Program and an associate professor at the Elliott School for International Affairs at George Washington University. Um, he's an expert on Central Asia with a focus on Uyghurs. And um, a couple of weeks ago in Toronto, I, I heard him speaking in fluent Uyghur to uh, a, a group of Uyghur women at a um, seminar. Um, so I was pretty impressed by that. Um, <laughs> And uh, he's spent many years um, researching Uyghur communities in both Central Asia and China. Um, he produced a film called Waiting for Uyghuristan, um, which focused on the Uyghurs um, in the Kazakhstan, China borderland. Um, he's also uh, published many articles, and he frequently writes about um, Uyghurs on his blog called The Roberts Report. I encourage everyone to check that out. And um, Dr. Roberts, the title of his presentation is From Dangerous Terrorists to Ungrateful and Unproductive Minorities, Shifting Hand Perceptions of Uyghurs in China as a Result of the July Events. So thank you, Dr. Roberts. Does that work? Yeah. Um, well, I've been asked to speak a, about, um, not about the causes of the events in July, but about maybe some of the implications uh, afterwards. Although I have to say that at some point I have to talk about some of the causes because I think some of the root causes of the <coughs> events in July actually um, have not been resolved and therefore have great, great implications for the future of the situation. I fear that perhaps one of the most lasting legacies of the unrest this past summer in Urumqi will be its long-term influence on Han perceptions of Uyghurs in China. In many ways, the events of the summer mark a, 
perceptible shift in Han stereotypes of Uyghurs and perhaps of all minorities, or at least those who voice discontent with the Chinese government. Yeah, better? Uh, for some eight years, China's government has been cultivating an image of Uyghurs as dangerous terrorists who could pose a national security threat to the state. This, of course, culminated during the Olympics when the hysteria of a Uyghur terrorist threat reached fever pitch. It is ironic, however, that after eight years of rhetoric suggesting that Uyghurs pose a substantial security threat to the Chinese state as terrorists and separatists, the worst violence in Xinjiang in over a decade would be sparked by a protest of Uyghurs carrying flags of the People's Republic of China and calling for more protection from the state, not separation from it. While the Chinese state has continued to suggest that the July events and the alleged needle attacks that followed were something akin to a terrorist attack, I believe it is self-evident to most people, even inside China, that this was not the case. Rather, it is my sense that the July events have created a new narrative about Uyghurs that has been partly cultivated by the government, but even more fanned by populist sentiments among average Han citizens. That narrative is one of the ungrateful, entitled, lazy, and potentially violent minority. This should be a familiar stereotype for most Americans. It has dominated populist, racist stereotypes about African Americans, and it has been common, a common trope in the U.S. immigration debate with regards to illegal immigrants from Mexico and Central America. Now, this characterization of Uyghurs in China is not entirely new either. Han Chinese, especially new immigrants to Xinjiang, have long held stereotypes of Uyghurs as drug addicts, criminals, and more generally, lazy, unproductive people. What seems to be changing now, however, is that many Han Chinese are beginning to perceive of these stereotype characteristics of Uyghurs as a threat to China's economic livelihood, and after the events in July, increasingly as a threat to their own personal security. Uh, after I had done a WashingtonPost.com chat session on the Urumqi events in early July, uh, I received an email from a Han Chinese man who set out this argument and his fears, quite frankly. He wrote to me, the reason for the riot and deep resentment among Uyghurs towards Han Chinese is not oppression by Chinese government. Quite to the contrary, it is the over-pampering national policies to make Uyghurs happy. Small crimes made by Uyghurs are often overlooked by Chinese police. Uyghurs get ridiculous advantage in college entrance exams. Maybe it is hard to believe, but when you have state policies that treat a small minority group so unfairly, and here he means uh, in a positive light, well, it only makes them weak. They lose the competitive edge in the business world. There is little incentive for them to get better. Ignoring the small s crimes like thievery is only going to foster the bigger criminals like rapists and murderers. Since the summer, I have twice spoken about uh, the Urumqi unrest at public events similar to the one today. And each time, Han attendees in the audience have echoed similar comments about Uyghurs. And yet they've been virtually silent about the terrorism issue that dominated discussions about Uyghurs previously. At a Central Asian Studies Conference, uh, a Han Chinese suggested that Uyghurs were lazy because they were Muslim and prayed too often, an allegation that quickly drew criticism from the rest of the crowd who were all studying uh, Muslim societies. At another round table at a local university, a student from China complained that Uyghurs had too many entitlements in China and were often dealt with leniently by criminal courts, making them less productive members of society and encouraging their criminal behavior. It is difficult to know how widespread these sentiments are, but the protests by Han Chinese in Urumqi after the alleged needle attacks suggest that they at least run deep among Han in Xinjiang. Although in some ways these stereotypes of Uyghurs are more benign than the accusations of terrorism that have been so popular in China over the last eight years, they also suggest a deeper divide between Han and all Uyghurs in China. Claims of terrorism had previously been directed only at some Uyghurs, those bad apples among the people, those who had gone astray. 
By contrast, the stereotype of Uyghurs as ungrateful and overly entitled minorities is often posed in a much more wide-sweeping racist manner that encompasses the entire Uyghur people. These sentiments also suggest a desire on the part of many Han in China to further marginalize Uyghurs in Chinese society. And I think that um, we can expect there to be more and more discussion about minority policies uh, with regards to that as well. Um, I believe this bodes quite negatively for the future of Han Uyghur relations in Xinjiang and is symptomatic of the root causes of the unrest in Urumqi in July. In many ways, I see the causes of the events in Urumqi as being primarily a product of China's development policy in Xinjiang. If China had long viewed the region as a strategic buffer zone that could shield it from Western neighbors, China's emergence on the global economic stage has suddenly made Xinjiang a critical region economically as an opening to the West for trade and perhaps most importantly as a thoroughfare for hydrocarbon pipelines from Central Asia. As a, result, as a result, China's develop the West policy in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region has encouraged breakneck speed development that while attempting to in integrate Xinjiang more into the rest of China, is simultaneously displacing Uyghurs from their traditional livelihoods, homes, and farmlands. At the same time, this development is making the region a zone of opportunity for Han migrants who hope to benefit from it. As a result, Uyghurs are quickly becoming a minority in their own homeland, and they are increasingly marginalized economically in its urban centers, such as Urumqi. Many of the Han migrants who have high hopes in coming to the region, however, do not see it that way. Instead, they see Uyghurs as a nuisance that stands in the way of their pursuit of prosperity. Presumably, in order to prevent the type of unrest we saw in July, the Chinese state has also established as part of these development plans, a variety of programs intended to integrate Uyghurs more into China's society as a whole. The state is offering scholarships to Uyghurs to study in Han-dominated universities outside Xinjiang, creating programs to place Uyghurs in industrial jobs at factories in the interior of China with mostly Han workers, and offering incentives to Uyghurs to send their children to Mandarin language schools. These quote-unquote entitlements are aggravating the Han migrants and, as I suggested earlier, Han populace more generally in China. But neither the Chinese state nor Han populace understand that these particular entitlements are not attractive to the majority of Uyghurs, who prefer to stay in Xinjiang and continue to per pursue their traditional livelihoods and operate in their native language. Uyghurs instead view these entitlements as attempts to destroy their culture. Coupled with the information blockade, executions, and arrests of Uyghurs uh, that is going on now in Xinjiang, these issues are not placating Uyghurs, but further alienating them within the PRC. All of these things together suggest a growing rift between Uyghurs and Han in the region. Uh, and I believe that this rift will continue to deepen for the foreseeable future. So to, to address the question that um, Amy opened up with um, about, or uh, actually I guess it was Louisa was talking about, how do we get out of this situation? Um, I think that we really have to look at the development policies in the region. And I don't think that until the PRC is ready to reevaluate how it develops Xinjiang um, and to address the, the uh, need to have Uyghurs involved in that discussion, not much will change in the near future. And I, I also think that, this, that the development encounter that's ongoing between migrants and the local Uyghur population is also aggravating attitudes among the Han towards the Uyghurs. So it's, it's, it's not only that it's uh, creating problems for the Uyghurs and uh, creating a certain amount of animosity of Uyghurs towards Han. So um, I'll leave it at that and await your questions during the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for your excellent remarks. <clears throat> 
Um, now I'd like to introduce <coughs> Dr. David Dahai Yu, um, who is the editor of Beijing Spring. And I know that he, uh, through his work um, at Beijing Spring, he and his colleagues have very actively worked to uh, promote dialogue between um, Chinese and Uyghurs and Tibetans. Um, and they have, uh, um, in, in the Beijing Spring, they have um, frequently raised um, issues of concern to um, Uyghur and Tibetan uh, rights activists, um, including um, since the July unrest took place. Um, Dr. Yu grew up in Tianjin and graduated from Beijing University. Um, he took part in local elections in, in 1980 as a college student, and he co-founded the Chinese Economist Society of USA and served as its first president in 1985 and 1986. Um, he's taught at several U.S. colleges, and he earned a doctorate degree in economics from Princeton University. Um, Dr. Yu is... Um, Going to the title of his presentation will be the importance of Uyghur Western solidarity. So, um, with that, I welcome Dr. Yu's remarks. Well, good morning. I feel I feel like um, making a presentation standing up. So. Um, um, uh, first of all, I want to express my appreciation to the Laogai Foundation and the Uyghur American Association for the Uyghur Experience uh, exhibit at the Laogai Museum. I just came from a short visit of the exhibit. I can <coughs> tell you that the exhibit uh, really is very well done. It gives the public a chance to learn of the plight of the Uyghurs. and. Uh, uh, it can help people understand events such as the July 5th riots in Rumuchi. Now, talking about the Uyghur experience over the past 60 <coughs> years, as a Chinese, I want to say that the past 60 years have been disastrous not only for the Uyghurs, but for the Chinese as well. The Uyghurs, however, uh, obviously suffered more uh, than the Chinese. Uh, there are several uh, reasons for this. Number one, we know that the communist regime is a Chinese regime. Uh, in a sense, we can say that the Chinese chose communists over the nationalists. So if they suffered, um, we can say that they suffered as a result of their or our uh, choice. Uh, the regime, however, was simply imposed on the Uyghurs. They never chose communism in any sense. Secondly, while uh, the Chinese and the Uyghurs both suffered as a result of the uh, ruinous economic policies and the uh, insane political purges over the past uh, 60 years. Uyghurs had more causes for suffering. Uh, they had to endure restrictions on their religious practices, uh, and they were subject to wholesale uh, synthesization programs. They bore the brunt of the nuclear test at Lough Noor, in which, uh, which caused thousands of Uyghur deaths. E up to today, the Chinese government doesn't want to talk at all about you know, the consequences of those nuclear tests. The whole thing is a taboo uh, pro uh, topic. The Uyghurs also became a minority in many areas of their own uh, homeland. The third thing I want to mention is that after the um, uh, economic liberalization, uh, the coastal areas of China developed tremendously. But you know, China is a big country. It has a big outback. And uh, this outback uh, lagged far behind. And the Uyghur areas are decidedly within this outback. The oil and the gas fields at uh, Karame and Tarim fueled China's economic rise, but brought very little benefit to the Uyghurs. In addition, because of this economic liberalization uh, program, 
the traditional communist ideology became sort of irrelevant. In its place, the Chinese leaders promoted nationalism. But their brand of nationalism is really <coughs> Chinese chauvinism. It requires the denigration of non-Chinese people and especially the minority groups within the Chinese borders. So it is not surprising that the Uyghurs became more and more uh, dissatisfied and it's not surprising that some Uyghurs took extreme actions on occasion such as the uh, June 5th riots. Now faced with all this gross injustice, the mainstream Uyghur groups such as the Uyghur National Congress and the Uyghur American Association steadfastly uh, adhere to the principle of nonviolence. Uh, now I admire and applaud their uh, position. I think this conscientious choice reflects wisdom, it reflects moral courage. And I also condemn the Chinese government's effort uh, to uh, portray the overseas Uyghurs as instigators of violence. They produced evidence, but if you look carefully, you realize the, the evidence makes no sense at all except as an insult to the soundness of mind of the Chinese people. <laughs> um, as a Chinese dissident, I know very well the uh, slander tactics of the Chinese government. Uh, when they slaughtered hundreds of peaceful protesters in Beijing in, back in 1989, they also portrayed outside groups as instigators of violence. <coughs> The astonishing thing is, after 30 years of reform and supposed progress, the Chinese government just finds it impossible to kick this old habit of fabrication and slander. Now, I would like to say a few words about the uh, Chinese government's program to fight against the so-called three evil forces, separatism, religious extremism, and terrorism. Like many other ideas from the Chinese government, this program cannot really withstand scrutiny. Let's talk about uh, separatism. You know, some people are in favor of uh, the independence of East Turkestan or Tibet or Taiwan. Uh, some people are opposed. But unless somebody starts a armed insurrection or some ki other kind of violence, this is really a matter of opinion. And the government really has no business criminalizing opinions. Louisa mentioned very clearly, uh, said very well that uh, the Chinese government has a, a, a great misunderstanding of the nature of the freedom of speech. And let's talk about um, extremism. Now I find it uh, astonishing that the godless communists have the temerity to brand others as religious extremists. Isn't their atheist position blatantly extreme? But it doesn't matter. As long as one does not try to impose one's beliefs upon others by coercion, religious beliefs or beliefs in general, as long as, even if they are extreme, should not be uh, criminalized. Now finally, let's talk about uh, terrorism. Now it is true that some Uyghurs uh, committed terror acts, uh, but it is also very clear that the mainstream Uyghur groups are firmly opposed to violence and terrorism of any form. Uh, the problem is the Chinese government uses terrorism as a convenient label to demonize <coughs> its political enemies. And these include not only the Uyghurs, but the Tibetans and the Chinese dissidents as well. And so my verdict for this uh, uh, campaign against three evil forces is in fact, it is an assault on the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, and the truth itself. Now, I'm sorry to say that the Chinese government's propaganda has been rather effective. The average Chinese appears to believe, besides the, uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Roberts said, uh, besides uh, the, the belief that they are lazy or uh, backward. They also, uh, the average Chinese also seems to believe that the Uyghurs are a violent people bent, hell-bent on achieving their independence. Now even some 
dissidents are affected, I believe, by this propaganda. At Beijing Spring, for example, we are often asked of our position on the independence of East Turkestan, uh, Tibet, and Taiwan. The questioners seem to believe that if we are in favor of the independence of these areas, then uh, it, the government has every right to, you know, ban our publication, uh, prevent us from returning to China, even jail our associates uh, in China. That, of course, is a very twisted position for a, uh, for a dissident. And another example, after the July uh, 5th riots, our chief editor, Hu Ping, wrote an article uh, saying that the riots were caused in part by the suppress suppression of peaceful protests uh, in Wumuchi. Now, that article, which seems to me very uh, reasonable, well-argued, uh, caused a firestorm on the internet. Even many veteran dissidents accused Hu Ping of justifying terrorism, something he patently did not do. Even Taiwan, which for many years was the hope of all freedom-loving Chinese, really behaved discreditably when it refused the visa application of Ms. Kadir on alleged terrorist ties. Now, what can the Uyghurs do in this adverse environment? Besides continuing to adhere to the principle of nonviolence, my basic suggestion is for the Uyghurs to make a greater effort to reach out to the Chinese. After all, the 10 million Uyghurs are fated to live side by side with the over billion uh, Chinese. Uh, in this regard, I think the Uyghurs can learn a great deal from the Tibetans. I attended the uh, Sino-Tibetan Dialogue Conference in Geneva back in uh, August, and I was once again amazed by the amount of effort the Tibetans put in to explaining themselves <coughs> to the Chinese. Now, as a Chinese dissident, I sometimes find the positions taken by the Tibetans a bit too soft. For example, uh, even after the crackdown of the protesting monks last year, the Dalai Lama continued to support the uh, uh, Olympic efforts uh, of China. And the Dalai Lama also keeps talking about finding win-win solutions within the framework of the PRC. Even though I find these positions soft, I nevertheless i am deeply impressed by the efforts by the Tibetans to reach out to the Chinese, and especially by the humility, the calmness, and the genuine human compassion exhibited by the Dalai Lama. Now, uh, with all these efforts, I think the Tibetans did make a substantial uh, difference. Uh, the Dalai Lama, in particular, is highly regarded even among many Chinese, and among the dissidents, uh, he is really a paragon and an inspiration. So I uh, would like to encourage the Uyghurs to emulate the example of the Dalai Lama, and I pledge that we'll do our part to promote uh, Sino-Uyghur uh, understanding and friendship. And that brings me to the issue of Uyghur Western solidarity. I believe that in order to successfully reach out to the Ch Chinese, the Uyghurs need to maintain a Western orientation. Of course, the Uyghurs need to keep close relations with Muslim groups, especially the Turkish, spe the Turkish peoples, but it is important for the Uyghurs to uphold the uh, to uphold a secularism and the notion of individual rights. It, also, it is also important for the Uyghurs to consider the Western societies not only as allies but as model societies as well. This is, orientation is a necessary basis for good Sino. Uyghur uh, relations. 
In upholding democratic values, the Uyghurs can find many soulmates within the Chinese society, especially among the uh, intellectuals. In demanding um, religious freedom, for example, you would be able to find, uh, as potential allies, many, many uh, Chinese believers. These include, by some estimates, some 50 million Buddhists, some 50 million Falun Gong practitioners, and some 100 million Christians. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of potential allies. Furthermore, even though the Chinese democracy movement is not strong at the present, it does have deep roots going back all the way to Sun Yat-sen's nationalist revolution of 1911. This movement can quickly gather strength when opportunity arises. I can say that democracy is a language that the Chinese can eventually understand. But the same is not true for political aspirations based on Islam. Now, in addition, by allying with the West, the Uyghurs may be able to contribute to a grand alliance in an epic struggle, an alliance that stands on the right side of history. Let me begin to explain this by presenting the following statement. This is a quote. If we liken the world capitalist system to a boxing platform, then our short and intermediate term goal is to defeat the boxing champ. And our ultimate goal is to smash the boxing platform. Now this sounds like something that uh, Mao Zedong might have said, but it isn't. Let me give you another quote. Here's another statement. Wherever China's core economic interests lie, there show the forces of the Liberation Army cover. Now I think even Mao might not have the audacity to say something like this. Both of these statements are from a book published earlier this year called China is Displeased. This book was a publication sensation in China. It sold some 600,000 copies in its first month. It was very enthusiastically received in China, though at least one reader called it the Chinese version of the Mein Kampf. Well, more aggressive than the official pronouncement, I think the book does reflect the sentiments of many within the establishment. These sentiments briefly are that China has been bullied and is still being bullied by the West, that China has better economic and political systems and better morals, that China can replace the United States as the leader of the world, and, it is, and that it is important for China to get prepared psychologically and militarily to take over. Now, of course, these are dangerous ideas. So the way I see it, 64 years, okay, I, I need only one more minute. <laughs> 64 years after the defeat of the Nazis and 20 years after the fall of the Berlin War, the uh, Berlin Wall, the struggle between liberalism and authoritarianism still has no, side, no end in sight. One part of this struggle is the Western democracies, which are based on the notion of natural rights formulated by John Locke and the liberal thinkers of his time. The other party uh, is the Chinese communists together with Islamic fundamentalist groups such as the ruling mullahs of Iran and the Taliban. Their ideas are, have affinity to those forwarded by Thomas Hobbes, 
they require the absolute obedience to the state, the Leviathan. With the Western countries stumbling economically and unsure in their security outlook, and with China rising fast, I'm afraid the struggle between the free man or free woman and the Leviathan may ratchet up again. A new Cold War may be in the offing in which the futures of the Uyghurs, the West, and the freedom-loving Chinese are inexorably bound together. In this struggle, the Uyghurs may have a unique and vital strategic role to play. Whether the West can win this Cold War depends on its willpower, really. And I think it is important for the West to realize that its support uh, to the Uyghur group, to the groups such as the Uyghurs, is not merely a humanitarian gesture, it's not even primarily about human rights. This support is a matter of national security. If the West is sufficiently determined, then I believe that the free man can once again defeat the Leviathan and the Uyghurs and the Chinese and the West will all have a better, brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yi, for your remarks. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce our third and final speaker, Nuri Turkle. Um, Nuri, in addition to being a busy lawyer on K Street, um, he's very involved in Uyghur human rights activism. Uh, he's been quite active in um, uh, advocating on behalf of the rights of Uyghurs detained in um, the Guant Guantanamo Bay. Um, he, as Louisa mentioned earlier, um, he is the immediate past president of the Uyghur American Association, and in that capacity, he co-founded and directed the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Um, he is a, a busy speaker, um, testifying frequently uh, before the U.S. Congress and um, other government and academic institutions. He also is frequently published in uh, major media publications and, sp and speaks um, quite frequently to um, some uh, well-known media outlets including CNN, BBC, Fox News, um, and NPR. Um, the title of Nuri's presentation will be Chinese Government Propaganda and Perceptions of Uyghurs in the PRC. So, please, Nuri. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that warm, uh, welcoming introduction. Um, I wanted to thank the organizers of today's event, the NED, Uyghur American Association, and the Law Grade Research Foundation. Uh, it's critically important, as the previous speakers uh, said, uh, to enhance the understanding of the Uyghur Han um, uh, concerns uh, in order to prevent <coughs> the future <coughs> Ethnic conflict. Excuse me, I am a little under the weather today, so I might be coughing during my presentation. Apologize for that beforehand. Um, as um, the previous speakers already mentioned, the historic perception of the Uyghurs and Han Chinese, I'm not going to develop too much on the uh, uh, how Han Chinese people see the Uyghurs, uh, such as, you know, historically minority or uh, different looking people or uh, knows how to dance and sing, you know, Meng Shang, that sort of stuff. So I'm not go I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but I'm going to be focusing mostly on how government is uh, making it worse. Uh, hardline statements, uh, encouragements, and uh, allowing the Han Chinese uh, nationalism to uh, to help the Chinese state with its oppressive policies. Um, one other thing that was not mentioned uh, in the previous discussion is the uh, 
United States role. Um, I have to uh, emphasize this is because uh, the hasty designation of ETIM back in 2002 not only helped to damage the uh, credibility and uh, the image of the Uyghurs uh, in the West, but also helped to further Chinese propaganda that the Uyghurs, in fact, do have some terrorism activities was going on. Uh, the recognition by the United States government of this organization, ETIM, as a terrorist organization uh, given uh, created some social um, uh, perception uh, that the Uyghurs are, in fact, are terrorists. Um, during the Olympics uh, and before the Olympics, Chinese government uh, used several methods. One is to evict the uh, Han, uh, Uyghur residents from the major Chinese cities uh, like Shanghai and Beijing and send them home. And also, as this notice indicates, specifically instructed the uh, Han Chinese hotel, motel, and the bathhouse owners in Beijing to deny uh, uh, the Han Chinese, uh, excuse me, the Uyghurs and Tibetans from using their facilities, the basic amenities. Uh, you can read from that uh, poster on the, on the, on the uh, slide. <clears throat> and also, um, um, the, Han Ch the Chinese government uh, continued this mass arrest uh, in retaliation of what happened in Kashgar, particularly in the month of August, uh, where uh, some uh, Wujing uh, uh, were uh, killed by uh, two uh, Uyghur individuals. Um, you can see some of the hardline hard statements uh, came out from the Chinese government uh, officials and the uh, media, such as um, uh, take the next uh, str 